Welcome, comrades, to the art of cinema. This is a mandatory re-education session of the People's Republic of F. Let us hasten final victory through a revolutionary ideological offensive. We're monitoring your viewing, and we know if you're not watching. I am Colonel T., Minister of Propaganda, and with me, as always, is our glorious leader, General Secretary F., the eternal leader of our revolution, the mastermind of the revolution. Yes, I am all those things, that's true. The People's Republic of F must bind together and build up the glorious nation at breakneck speed. Let us make large numbers of ideological missiles capable of severely damaging the enemy and instilling firm confidence in the victory of our service personnel and people. Absolutely. This is the first episode of The Art of Cinema, a new project of the Ministry of Propaganda of the People's Republic of F. We will be examining movies from the 1990s. You, the people of the People's Republic of F, are now required by law to consider these movies to be the best movies of the 90s. And General Secretary F and I will instruct you in the opinions you are required to have about them. So pay attention, citizens of the People's Republic of F. When you meet someone and strike up a conversation about movies, you never know when that person might turn out to be one of your monitors from the PRF secret police. And the secret police don't want to discover that your ideas about movies run counter to the glorious revolution. They don't want to have to send you to a labor camp. They only want to see that in your words and opinions, you remain committed to our great cause. Yes. So, without further ado, let's talk about Tombstone, which was released on Christmas Day in 1993. It's 1879, the Civil War is over, and Americans move to the Old West. Wyatt Earp was the sheriff at Dodge City, Kansas, but he doesn't want to be sheriff anymore. He moves to Tombstone with his brothers and their wives. Did he move there to become a glorious leader? Is that because he was tired of being sheriff? Well, we're going to get to that, actually. Okay. They're at Tombstone to seek their fortune, which... Wyatt Earp gets by running a gambling parlor out of one of the saloons. Mm, yeah, there's to be no gambling in a social society like ours. To set up in the gambling parlor, he has to uh, slap Billy Bob Thornton around and he throws him out. This scene establishes Wyatt Earp's superpower, essentially. Mm. He's a badass. He's the Batman of Tombstone, essentially. So Tombstone is instructive. Tombstone is educative. That's why the people of the People's Republic of F need to understand it as a metaphor. When the people see Wyatt Earp, they should think of him as our ever-victorious, iron-willed commander, General <laughs> Secretary F. But we're going to find out if Wyatt Earp can lead the glorious revolution and be the guarantee of the people's unification like you can, sir. Well, I think we know the answer to that, but <laughs> carry on. It's violent at Tombstone thanks to the Cowboys, who are the organized crime. I was always a Redskins fan. That's, that doesn't surprise me. The Cowboys are pure evil. Yeah. The opening scene of the movie, they kill a man on his wedding day and the priest, too. Mm, that but does the, not surprise me. The priest prophecies that Wyatt Earp will take vengeance on them. Mm. The question I have about this, though, the, the organized crime is called the Cowboys, mm. but this is Tombstone in the Old West. Isn't everyone a cowboy? It's like if this was Germany and the organized crime was called the Krauts. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I've got some problems with Germany. La Cosa Nostra is a much better name by the Italians. But in the PRF, of course, we have implemented the utopia, and the people have no need for organized crime. No. no. But the cowboys... Organized crime is reserved for the government. It's not organized crime if the government says it's okay. Mm. But it's just organized goodness. Well, we defer to your wisdom, sir. The Cowboys, the organized crime, have Curly Bill, played by Powers Booth. Have you seen uh, uh, Deadwood? No. Okay, well, Powers Booth also runs a saloon in Deadwood. 
The uh, Cowboys have Johnny Ringo, played by Michael Bain, who's taking a break from James Cameron movies. So he's taking a break from a uh, James Cameron movie. That's good. Well, he's in The Terminator. The Cowboys also have a young Thomas Hayden Church from Sideways. Oh, wasn't he also one of the little kids on Home Improvement? One of Wyatt Earp's crew is The Stranger from The Big Lebowski, Sam Elliott. Uh, Bill Paxton plays his other brother. Oh, from Big Love. Bill Paxton also taking a break from James Cameron movies and from chasing tornadoes around Oklahoma with Helen Hunt. Also taking a break from having many wives. He was in Big Love, an HBO show about uh, polygamy. So. Also, it might be a different actor. This might be the role that the Coens had in mind when they cast Sam Elliott as the stranger in The Big Lebowski. Hmm. Or when Billy Joel sang that song, The Stranger. We all fall in love, but we disregard the danger. Robert Mitchum narrates. Robert Mitchum, a veteran of, of old westerns from back in the uh, mid-20th century. On the Earps side, we have Doc Holliday. Doc is from the South. He is a scoundrel. Doc Holliday is a scoundrel, but he's Wyatt Earp's friend. Mm. Doc Holliday speaks Latin and plays Chopin on the piano. He's dying of tuberculosis. Mm. Um, I guess that Latin's not going to help you with that. Later, Charlton Heston from The Planet of the Apes takes care of him towards, oh. towards the end of the movie. You know who's in the film briefly? Who? You guessed it. Frank Stallone. 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 You guessed it. Tickle me, Frank Stallone. You guessed it. Frank Stallone. You guessed it. Frank Stallone. You guessed it. Frank Stallone. <laughs> Congratulations, Frank Stallone. He plays Ed Bailey, the guy Doc Holliday beats at cards and then stabs when you first meet him. Hmm. After they all get to Tombstone, they go to the theater and see a vaudeville. Part of it is a ballet setting of Faust. The cowboys shoot at the actors, the, the organized crime. They straight up shoot at the... Hmm. Actors on the stage, yeah. Sounds like some secret police could set that in order. Yeah, I think so. Wyatt Earp sees uh, Josephine Marcus there for the first time, a pretty actress. Ooh. Later, he runs into her when the two of them are uh, riding horses alone up in the mountains. So at what point does Doc get on the train with Clara? Because they got to get the train going a certain speed in order to get back to the future. So, Josephine is a hedonist. Mm. Her plan is to travel around and, and live off room service for the rest of her life, which is a great plan if you're very rich. And lucky for her, it turns out at the end of the movie that she is very rich. And we have many fine hotels and establishments in the People's Republic of F, and I'd be happy to put her up for a while. Yeah, we should invite Wyatt and Josephine. Yeah. Fortunately, Wyatt is available even though he's married because his wife is an opium addict, which means it doesn't matter what happens to her. Yeah. In fact, they write her off at the end of the movie by saying she dies of an overdose, so that lets Wyatt off the hook. Now, the people of the People's Republic of F will find this scene ridiculous. The two of them beginning their romantic relationship because they both happen to be riding horses alone in the mountains at the same time in the same place. You don't become involved in romantic relationships by chance. You will be assigned a partner by the Ministry of Social Engineering. You'll be given an itinerary. You'll be assigned a specific amount of time to spend together and mandatory activities to perform together. While you carry out these assignments, the secret police will be monitoring you. They'll submit reports to the Department of Interpersonal Surveillance, who will decide if you and your assigned partner are compatible and whether or not the relationship furthers the cause of the Glorious Revolution. And this plan, we've, we've seen it play out so many times, but it takes all of the stress out of relationships so that you can focus on making this a perfect society. Absolutely. Don't worry about anything. We got you covered. Mm -hmm. We it's will all, provide. It's all been engineered by experts. The people who understand. Incidentally, that's not you. No, no, that's us. Yeah. Well, me. The second act starts when Curly Bill from the Cowboys kills the sheriff. So 
Wyatt Earp's brother and the stranger deputize themselves to clean up the town, but Wyatt won't go back to the law. He'd had to shoot someone back when he was sheriff at Dodge City, and that was traumatic for him. Mm. But the standoff between the cowboys and Earp's crew is heating up. They can see a fight is coming, so Wyatt gets sworn in to be there for his brothers, and then we get the showdown at the O.K. Corral. The cowboys have no tactics, no strategy. They get routed by the Earps. Well, and they have no defense, and their offense is questionable. They're not moving the football no. down the field. They're not splitting the uprights. Mm -mm. They get routed by the Earps, and this is what America can expect when their envy of our utopia leads them to take up arms against us. Mm. This movie is a good depiction of the chaos of America, everyone having gunfights and aimlessly wandering the Old West instead of marching in rank and file behind General Secretary F as he leads them fearlessly down the path of revolution. That's why they'll never defeat us. Never. It's not possible. Mm -mm. No. The cowboys get revenge, killing Wyatt Earp's brother and crippling the stranger. Mm. Wyatt is transformed into an instrument of vengeance upon the cowboys. He and his crew clean Tombstone up. He uses his gunslinger superpowers over and over. This guy sounds like me. It's the way that I cleared out all of the dissidents right. from our nation. Exactly. As I said, this is a metaphor. Yeah, for me. One scene by a river where he walks right out into the cowboy's line of fire, but none of them can hit him, and he gets Curly Bill. So Johnny Ringo steps up as the leader of the cowboys and tells Wyatt Earp to throw down, as it were. Mm. But Doc Holliday saves Wyatt. This is the great gunfight scene at the end of Tombstone. So in the end, this is a fun story. Wyatt Earp beats up on the cowboys, but there's no way he could have then become the mastermind of the revolution. No, I don't see it. He didn't have it in him to be the highest incarnation of revolutionary comradeship like you did, sir. Well, he certainly didn't have the hopes and dreams of the entire nation resting upon his person. He did not. No. White Earp wasn't even the best of our heroes here. That was Doc Holliday, but Holliday was in failing health. Fate had not selected him to be the people's master engineer, the genius who understood how to keep the gears turning in the engine of progress. No, and had he lived in the People's Republic of F, then our superior health care would have certainly healed him of whatever gunshot wounds he sustained. Mm. If they made a sequel to this movie, it would just be scenes of Wyatt Earp and Josephine Marcus checking into hotels and ordering some more room service. They wouldn't have been able to inspire all the people to turn out in a general offensive to hasten final victory in the revolutionary spirit of F. I bet they can't even march. One last note, there's a half-hearted attempt in the film to set up a Faust theme. The production of Tombstone was something of a mess. They had a screenwriter and director at helm of the project at first, but it was a freshman project in Hollywood for him. Mm. He was overwhelmed by the task, and they eventually had to replace him. Kurt Russell, as I understand it, actually had to take over, more or less, as, as director, so... It's pretty clear, especially with regard to this Faust theme, that there's a great deal they intended to put into the movie that actually didn't make the final cut. So let's take a minute and review the plot of Faust, especially Goethe's treatment of it. I'll tell you all this, the problems they were having with directors. We don't have those kind of problems here in the PRF because I direct everything. Absolutely, sir. So it already turns out fine. Mm -hmm. I'll have to go... Finding different directors. That's ridiculous. You're correct. Inefficient. Sir. That's, yeah. Mephistopheles leads Faust through experiences that culminate in a lustful relationship with Gretchen, an innocent young woman. Hmm. Gretchen and her family are destroyed by Mephistopheles' deceptions and Faust's desires. Part one of the story ends in tragedy for Faust, as Gretchen is saved, but Faust is left to grieve in shame. The second part begins with the spirits of the earth forgiving Faust and the rest of mankind and progresses into allegorical poetry. Faust and his devil pass through and manipulate the world of politics and the world of the classical gods and meet with Helen of Troy, the personification of beauty. Finally, having succeeded in taming the very forces of war and nature, 
Faust experiences a singular moment of happiness. So, when Wyatt Earp and his brothers arrive in Tombstone, there's no, there's no selling his soul to the devil, unless you interpret him having left being the sheriff at Dodge City, Kansas, to go seek his fortune in Tombstone to be selling his soul to the devil, or selling his soul to the devil could be abandoning his wife for Josephine Marcus, the actress, or even selling his soul to the devil could be, at a stretch, the the 20th century social revolution and upheavals that are on the horizon, and the movie makes a number of references to these. Here, he, sold, let, he sold his soul long before arriving in Tombstone by agreeing to be one of the thugs in charge of enforcing the unfair laws of an unsocial society like the United States in the 1800s or in the 1900s or in the 2000s mm. or in the 2100s. It's all the same. So, in the first part, Mephistopheles leads Faust through experiences that culminate in a lustful relationship with Gretchen. Now, that would seem to be Josephine Marcus, the actress who he falls for and ultimately leaves his wife for. Mm. Then Gretchen and her family are destroyed by Mephistopheles' deceptions and Faust's desires. So, White Earp's wife, though, is destroyed because she's a laudanum addict or a, an opium addict, not mm. by Mephistopheles' deceptions and Faust's desires. You know, some people would call opium the opiate of the masses. Gretchen is saved, but Faust is left to grieve in shame. That could correspond to when Josephine leaves town and uh, Wyatt Earp is left to clean the place up and he's, he's shamed by her. That makes sense. It does. Capitalist societies are filthy. The second part begins with the spirits of the earth forgiving Faust and progresses into allegorical poetry. Well, I don't think that made the cut of the movie. Faust and his devil pass through and manipulate the world of politics and the world of the classical gods and meet with Helen of Troy, the personification of beauty. Again, could be Josephine Marcus. Finally, having succeeded in taming the very forces of war and nature, that's Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday taking out the cowboys, Faust experiences a singular moment of happiness, and that's when, at the end of the movie, he uh, reunites with Josephine, I think in Denver. Mm. So, so you're saying that the cowboys traded him to the Broncos. So, there you have it. People of the People's Republic of F, Tombstone. This has been The Art of Cinema with our glorious leader, General Secretary F. Let us maintain vigilance against the ever-looming threat of an American invasion. You are required to report any non-participation or dissent amongst your comrades. Don't forget to tune in to The Art of Cinema again next time for further discussion of films from the 1990s in your next mandatory re-education session.